scaring me. It's like really scary. Everybody on Zoom, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so really quickly, we're happy to have you here today. We introduced our um, co-sponsors, Don, Nelia, Natalie, and Stacy, who are in the room with us. And it would not be possible to have this event without our WIC steering committee. Okay, so why are we here? This is really important. 27% of professional computing occupations in the U.S. workforce are held by women. 27, it's kind of low, um, versus 57 of total workforce positions that are held by women nationally. Okay, so 22% of computer information science bachelor's degrees were earned by women versus 58% overall. So what it's saying is if we can have more women getting bachelors, potentially we'll have more women in IT in the future. The numbers are low, so we definitely have opportunities and we have work to do. Let's take a look at NYU. NYU, we're 2% above national rate, but I think we can do better. I know we can do better. And so I think this is a great opportunity for us to brainstorm Think about other ways that we can do outreach potentially um, for students just coming to the university, for women who work at NYU already, and then thinking about how to get them in C-suite positions. We had an IT Emerging Leaders cohort. We have some members of that cohort in the room. 35% um, of that cohort were women. So we're trying to do the work, but we can do better. And so I want to introduce an outreach program that we launched a few months ago. Frances Bauer used to work here. She passed away a few years ago. But um, when we first launched WIC, Natalie and I heard a rumor that Frances was very unhappy because we didn't know why. So we said, let's go talk to her. And she said, you know, it's too late. You're too late. You need to reach kids. You need to reach someone their kids because they have already decided what they want to do. So something women in technology is really going to focus on this year is this Bauer Outreach Program, raising awareness and interest for STEM in elementary schools, primarily in underserved communities. And so if anyone wants to volunteer, we have our email here. We're going to email out the deck. We're going to send out the recording. But this is a great opportunity, right, as we look at those numbers of students who are getting a bachelor's, like reaching people younger. I also want to announce who our WIT Trailblazer is. So we have a WIT Trailblazer every few months. Um, and we kind of took a break for a little while. But then this past year, we have Minerva Tom Taco come speak to us. And she's just amazing. She's our chief AI officer. And let's be real, AI right now is really big. Um, and she's just innovative and problem solving and thinking ahead about what are ways to solve issues that end up solving not just for women, but for the larger community. So Minerva is our wood trailblazer and we celebrate her um, and we're going to send this recording over to her. So congrats to Minerva. Okay, now I'm going to pass it over to Dawn to just share a few words with us. Thanks, Tamara. And for those online, uh, you missed some just uh, brilliant speaking by Tamara. Uh, so what I, uh, what I want to encourage you to do is next time to come in person. Uh, the, uh, you know, not only will we, uh, we'll turn on the microphone next time, honestly. <laughs> but, but what we really want, want you to do is come here and take advantage of the networking, right? So this is great. I mean, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got great speakers. But the, the second half is getting the chance to interact with your peers, to meet people, to learn from them. You know, as, as human beings, um, we need to be in, in real space. Zoom is not, you know, it's just not as good. So I encourage you to um, organize your days, to be able to make it for the next meeting. Come here, meet your colleagues, interact, and, uh, uh, you know, and get the full benefit of, of the WIT program. So, uh, so thank you. With that, Stacy. Are 
great. It's really nice to be back. And I see that slowly people snuck in and now all the tables are full. So this is so awesome. And I'm so happy that you all showed up um, for my friend Renee, who is our first external WIT speaker. So this is a very, very big event. Slide. Sorry. <laughs> oh, here. Oh, it's me. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was not expecting to see myself. Uh, so it's really, really great to see all of you. And people, I think, came from all different units across the university. I see people really from almost everywhere. Um, and I would just echo Don's comment that is wonderful. Like the vibe in the room is always really good. And it's really wonderful to see people in person. Uh, so uh, I am not a tech person, but I am a STEM person, um, and I'm a neuroscientist by training, and we just need more women in leadership positions across the entire spectrum of science and technology. Uh, so that's really what we're here to do, and we also applaud the men who support the women um, and the other people, uh, whoever you are and however you refer to yourselves. Um, we are all a community here of people who support other people, and so that's really wonderful. So I'm really thrilled today to introduce you to a truly, truly remarkable individual um, who has really broken barriers and paved the way for women in technology. Um, our special guest today embodies innovation, dedication, and a relentless pursuit of excellence in the tech world. So please join me in welcoming again my friend Renee Zog. Oh. And there you are, Renee. <laughs> Renee is really, really a visionary leader. Um, when I first met Renee, I thought she is unlike anyone I've ever met before. And I was fortunate to meet her through um, the Higher Ambition Leadership Institute. So we were both selected to participate in this amazing professional development program. Um, and her energy is so contagious and she's so super authentic and cool and funny. Um, and you'll see it in, in a minute. Um, so she's an advocate for diversity and inclusion in technology, a really a true inspiration to all of us gathered here today at NYU's WIT event. She has a true passion for driving positive change, a really strong commitment to her craft. She has blazed a trail in the tech industry that serves as a beacon of hope and a testament to what can be achieved through talent and hard work, and really mostly hard work um, and determination. So throughout her illustrious career, Renee has not only demonstrated exceptional technical prowess, but has also really made it her mission to encourage and empower other women to pursue careers in technology. She's really the perfect speaker for today. She's tirelessly worked to bridge the gender gap, to promote gender equality, and to create opportunities for underrepresented groups in the tech field. But that is not how Renee's story began at all. <laughs> Renee started at the very bottom of the ladder, working night shifts in the Aetna Data Center, where she worked her way up to a senior leadership role. Renee was the former vice president and global chief information officer at Otis, the elevator company. And prior to Otis, Renee served as senior vice president of enterprise infrastructure and cloud services at CVS Health, a Fortune 5 company. And she went there after it had been acquired by, from Aetna, right? And I just learned in a conversation that Aetna is a $127 billion a year business. So this is like no, no joke what we're talking here. Um, she focused on the implementation of digital technologies to successfully drive competitive advantages. So she was also really ahead of her time. We talk about these things now as if they're normal, but they used to not be normal at all. She's a fierce advocate for advancing women, and she's structured programs to increase representation. Renee's achievements are really nothing short of extraordinary. From her groundbreaking work to her leadership roles, she has consistently shattered glass ceilings and set new standards for excellence. Her dedication to mentorship, her involvement in various initiatives really highlight her commitment to nurturing the next generation of women in tech. And in addition to her professional achievements, Renee is generally a vocal advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and she actively champions initiatives that foster a more inclusive and equitable tech ecosystem. So 
As we listen to Renee speak today, let us draw inspiration from her journey and her unwavering commitment to making the tech sector a more welcoming and diverse place for us all. Without further ado, please join me in giving, the, in giving a warm and enthusiastic group to welcome to Renee Zog. We are honored to have you here with us today. Um, and for you to Wow, that was not the bio I submitted. <laughs> Seriously, though, no. um, my bio, I like it to be like two minutes, two minutes long, but this was this was wonderful. And I I know Stacy and her energy is infectious. And she embodies uh, authentic leadership. She really does. And so when she said, uh, would you like to do this? I thought to myself, um, okay, academic female, right? We are, I want you all to know, first thing that I never attended college. I started the night shift hanging 10 inch tapes. And oh, by the way, it says 40 years experience and when I was five. <laughs> These jobs I had were very quite technical and um, they were wrought with challenges. It's, it's never going to get easier. It's always going to get harder. And we talked about do hard better. And you do that throughout your career. So I am one of 14 children. I'm number 11. And um, a funny fact about being in a family that large. My mother and my older sister were pregnant together twice. <laughs> hey, mom, I'm pregnant. So am I. <laughs> it was great. Said no one ever. <laughs> um, no, growing up in a large family was just absolutely fabulous. And I think it gave me a real grounding of diverse perspective, how to deal with crisis, how to be flexible. And um, this sort of leads into my first nugget. My parents were A's. They were fantastic parents. And I just, you know, I just lovely, lovely. And um, I lost my mother when I was 18. Uh, but prior to that, she was just, just so profound and so giving up her time. You think you have 14 children, right? to sit you down and really make you think about things. And I remember going to her, I was a teenager and I didn't like my older sister. And I said, you know, how can we possibly come out of the same body? She is so mean. And she sat me down and she said, I mean, you never know the cross anybody bears. Have you really thought what's getting to the the meat of her knees. Can you be a better friend? And what she taught me was empathy. Right? I sat back, I'm like, no, I'm right. You know, and she said, no, 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 you really need to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And that carried with me from that day forward. And it applies in the corporate world more than you can ever think, right? You know, when you're negotiating a deal or you're trying to, to uh, set a vision or a mission for, for the team, you have to really understand where everybody is coming from and how they're going to react to that. So, you know, put, putting yourself in the, the other shoes is very critical. And think about it. When COVID hit, and we are all on Zoom calls, and we would just get on the call, and you just start jumping right into the topic. Take time to find out what's going on with the people on that call. And you're going to find you're going to become the super connector. And that's what I was called at when I was at Aetna. I was called the Maven Connector. If somebody wanted to find out how to get something done, they would say, hey, this is going on. Who should we work with? And I always seem to know that's because I was able to make those connections. And a lot of that is practicing. The second nugget I have, especially, and I'm going to pick on the women here a little bit, is don't be so hard on yourself. 
right? When you're in the throes of trying to manage big decisions, big budgets, you know, organization restructures, and you've got kids at home and you've got somebody with a runny nose and you forgot, oh man, there's a makeup soccer practice, right? All of that is going on and you kind of feel like you're being judged a little bit, right? Am I doing it right? I'm in my career and am I missing out as being a good parent for my children? And, you know, I gotta tell you, we are hard on ourselves from the second we look in the mirror, right? Oh man, you know, a little bit more wrinkles, a little thinning of the hair. Um, maybe you you put on a pound or two, right? Just from the second we look in the mirror, we are not saying, "Oh, you are absolutely gorgeous and beautiful, and you're going to slay it today." That's not how it works. That's not how it works. So, don't be hard on yourself. I mean, I have made tremendous mistakes, right, with my kids. One is, I got a call from the lunch lady. My daughter was in first grade, and she said, do you really want to give a pound of ham to your daughter? <laughs> and I can see myself making the sandwich. <laughs> but I put the sandwich in the meat tender and the pound of ham in her lunchbox. <laughs> and I, you know, in, in the back of my head, I thought, oh, you're at the lunch going, do, 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 do. you know, this Renee, she doesn't even know where her kids are. <laughs> Um, but you know, you have to laugh at yourself and, and say, you know, is she going to start? Do you have any crackers that she, you can give her with that ham? <laughs> <laughs> it happens. One time, and this one, you're going to be blown away. I'd be arrested today <laughs> in today's world. Um, my son wanted to buy his little, he's in the fifth grade. He wants to buy her chocolates for Valentine's Day. So, you know, I'm in Marshalls and I find a little paper mache box. Of, I thought, oh, she can put things in it, letters in it or whatever, little chocolates. Um, I got the call from the school. They were booze filled chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> So I guess she did in a one. It was like <laughs> gave it to the teacher, and it's like shambord, <laughs> all kinds of things in the chocolates. And so I'm like, oh my god, I was mortified. So I had to call the mother, right? and she, thank goodness she had a sense of humor and she just laughed. And um, when I talked to the principal, he says, "Yeah, we have a sign on the wall that says, don't eat the brownies Renee makes." <laughs> Seriously, though, don't be hard on yourself, especially today with social media, right? And Pinterest and, you know, birthday parties have just jumped the shark. They used to be pin the tail on a donkey and a pizza. Now it's, it's crazy. And, um, you know, you're going to make mistakes as a parent. You're going to make mistakes at work. You're going to learn from those mistakes. And it's okay. Your, your children are going to be okay. And it's okay to say, hey, I've got a makeup soccer practice. I'll get to this later on. And, and sometimes just what I would do is an Irish exit, right? Mm -hmm. I would just leave and not let people know I'm taking care of this business because I always took care of the outcome at the end. I, I didn't want people judging me because I always, you know, not always, I had to leave to go take care of something at, at home. So, and I think that's important. And actually, that does apply to men too. But um, I think women are just harder on themselves when things aren't perfectly aligned. There will always be a crisis at home and at work. Um, my uh, third method is practice affirmations. Right? I was, at the time, I was doing mergers and acquisitions and doing the technology integration. I did that for 13 acquisitions. And, um, you know, I, I was a vice president at the time and they said to me, do you want me, they just bought a brand new business and it was an international IT. And Aetna was a $64 billion company. The combined company with CVS was $170 billion. 
And, um, and you'd be surprised, CVS, only 19 billion is retail. Isn't that crazy? The rest is all in pharmacy and in um, and the health plan. So uh, they asked if I want to take International IT, which is a billion dollar company. They just purchased it, uh, offices in Dubai, uh, Ireland, and China. And I thought, what do I know about International IT? And my first reaction was no. Right. Nope, don't know anything about it. And then I said, well, if I don't take it, who are you going to give it to? And she said, Teddy. Teddy was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I was so much better than Teddy, right? And I thought, well, why did I think that I couldn't do this job? Now, of course, Internationally, there's going to be a lot of nuances in terms of culture and maybe some regulatory things, but technology, software, software, network, network, security, security, um, finances are finances. And I knew all of that. I knew how to negotiate. I knew how to set a strategy and I knew how to create a vision and get everybody in line and actually produce. So I thought to myself, I need to think better about myself. And it, it could have been my upbringing. Um, you know, there, I was born into a very strict Catholic family. Don't speak unless you're spoken to kind of thing. Um, so I started doing that. And I started doing that on my commute in. And by the time, can I swear just a little? Oh, All right. <laughs> by the time I got to work, I thought I am badass. <laughs> Is that your swear? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it gets worse now. <laughs> Potty mouth here. Um, no, seriously, you'll be surprised how when you repeat this to yourself. And there's actually probably some neuroscience behind all of this, right? That you you become more confident, uh, and you don't you're not as afraid to speak up. And I used to always sit in the back of the room, right? Because I am a listener. I do like um, I do like to kind of absorb what's happening in a room before I speak. But after I started practicing affirmations, I mean, I'm not just talking to, just to talk, but as soon as I felt, all right, I got this, out it went. And you could say, that yeah, was brilliant. Why didn't we talk about that a half hour ago? And so I started to learn how to practice my affirmations and be a little bit more confident in the room. And that, that started to explode. So a little trick doesn't cost you any money. <laughs> um, this one, uh, Stacy notes. And like I said, these are a little bit soft. They're not your normal go get them sort of uh, nuggets. But I believe, again, these are in the core of what has helped me. And that's practicing gratitude. Right? And there is a lot of neuroscience behind that. People that practice gratitude are more satisfied in their life in general, right? They sleep better, they have better immunity systems, and uh, you know, it, it, all kinds of great things for it, but it doesn't, it, you have to sort of get into the rhythm of it. And even on the call, I was on a call today, three women that were going through job crisis on the way from Connecticut to New York. And one that I thought, she's going to jump off a bridge. Right? I said, sit down and just tell me what is good in your life. Right? As soon as I started, to, she started telling me there was a change in her voice. Right? Her kids are doing good. Um, her dad finally got out of the hospital. Right? These things, she just said, you know, you're right, it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be. So I think if you practice gratitude, now two things. On commutes in, nobody needs to know you're doing it. You're thankful 
for not only things, but people, and also affirmations. You can do them together. Nobody needs to know you're doing it. You're not talking out loud to yourself, right? And if you get into that practice, you will find it will be a mindset shift and you get to work and just things aren't, don't, don't seem as serious, right? Um, the third thing is, and we, we went through this whole intentional leadership training. And a couple of things that I learned from that is you need to practice. If you want to up your game, you know where you suck, right? It, it could be you're great technically, but you're bad with people. You are a great leader, but you don't know financials for anything, right? You want to move up in any, any organization. You have to master all of those things, right? And it's easier to pull back and say, well, you know, that, that job has a lot of finance associated with it. I don't want to do finance. Believe me, any job or big job in a company, you've got to know your numbers because it's all about the numbers and how you can use them to your advantage and how they can be a disadvantage. Okay? And, and I got to, to work a lot with numbers uh, being in mergers and acquisitions. How can we, I mean, that is a time to really switch out the technology. That's when you got kind of this below the line leverage. And um, so that kind of became an art and science with me. And I would, you know, I remember uh, you're combining a $13 billion company with Aetna. And their IT department was about $700 million dollars. Well, my synergy target was $700 million. So I had to combine two companies and take a whole company IT out from a financial perspective. That's not easy, but there are ways to do it that don't impact people with renegotiating contracts, you know, switching to more open you know, software, all these sorts of levers that you pull. And, um, you know, I had to practice that. If anyone said, Renee, you know, do you like finance? No, but there was no way I was going to deliver the results that I was delivering without knowing that. The second thing is you might pick up on it a little bit, but I was in speech therapy from little toddler to high school, all the way through high school. I hated speaking in public. And it was hard for me. And actually there is some science about people that do not like public speaking. They have like a smaller gland in the back of their head um, by like 20%. I think mine is like 80% smaller. I really hated public speaking. And I had a speech coach that I went back to. She's been a friend all my life and she said, Renee, this sounds silly. I want you to take faces, you know, that's eight by 10 and put them on chairs. And when, before you go up in public speak, I want you to go to a conference room, plaster those chairs with the faces and talk to them. Now my staff thought I was absolutely nuts because I would speak in front of 500, 800 people at a time and, but yeah, before that, I would put the heads on the chairs and I would practice what I was going to say. Um, again, it's, it's intentional. I knew I had to up my game. I was a really bad hummer trying to fill the space by not making eye contact. And I have to practice it. So think about what you're not good at and what makes you uncomfortable. And if you see your boss is really good at it, you chances are they're there for that reason. So be intentional about where you need to up your game and actually work at it. Um, this one is one of mine that really pushed me into helping women, helping women advance. 
being in technology for at this at this time is like 35 years. Um, <clears throat> we did an exercise in Halleck that maybe had about 60 or so virtues or um, values, and you had to whittle it down. I don't know if you did that mm -hmm. exercise, right? And it's like, and they're all good, like, you know, uh, family, love, faith, uh, perseverance, all these things. And you had to get it down to 10, and then you, I got to have that 10 down to five, and then you had to get it down to one. And, you know, how do you put, you know, faith under family, under whatever. And I, so I really sat back and I said, what do I really value? And what, it, when it's out of a line, what, you know, what does it do to me internally? And my number one value is respect. When I'm not respected or I see other people aren't respected, it ain't gonna go well. Not that, not that it's not going to go well. If I don't take action, I will not be happy. And um, and plus other things are embodied with respect, you know, equity, fairness, all of that. I think is is all in there. Uh, when I was at Aetna, I was doing at the time I was the chief of staff to the CIO, and I ran strategy for IT, and I was doing. This DNI plan, and what I noticed was, you know, like tech, it can be very abysmal for women representation, even worse with women, um, people of color. And uh, but then I started comparing to the industry, and we were actually doing okay, but it still didn't feel good enough, especially in the higher roles, right? So. I actually pulled the whole company data. And what I found at Aetna was Aetna was 76% women in the entire company. It was a big service, you know, claims and call signers and things like that. And when I was looking at the demographics, as you went up uh, to the executive level, it was smaller and smaller. So we're at executive director. 68% women, I was like, okay, that's not bad, but going from executive director to VP, it went down to 23%. And so what really struck me was it wasn't a pipeline issue. There was a pipeline of 68% and by golly, they're, they're high performing women. You know, high potential, high performing women. You look it up in the system, they had to get graded that way. But why weren't they getting promoted? What, you know, what was happening there? So, <clears throat> again, this gets back to intentionality is I did the research and I, you know, found that companies with uh, high represented representation on boards and then the EC level. Uh, did better in terms of revenue, in some cases, by 26%. That's crazy. But when you think about healthcare, 95% of the healthcare decisions in the family are women making those decisions. So why didn't we have that level of representation? So um, I hired a consultant and Together we created PwC actually, and we created um, what I call the Women's Leadership Alliance. And I went to my boss. Now my boss was badass. <laughs> she, her, her, she was ops and technology. I mean, business ops was big. I think her budget was about eighteen billion alone. And uh, she never married and had no children. And so, and she was tough. I mean, she got up on her treadmill three o'clock, three thirty every morning, and she was in me, right? Um, she taught me a lot, but she also taught me a lot of things I shouldn't do. Uh, she told me I put, I did the business case. I said I've got a plan. 
We're going to do these work streams. One was succession planning, you know, the whole thing. And she said, Renee, you, you realize that I gave my life to my job. Like, you know, to live to work, work to live. Um, <sighs> she lived to work. And she said, you know, that I got to where I was because I had to give all that up. And the CEO had kids, the CFO had kids, you know, everybody else on the EC had kids except her. And I said, are you telling me I could never be a CIO because I have kids? And she sat back and she said, you have your new executive sponsor, right? And we took it to actually Mark Bertolini, who was the CEO at the time, uh, took it to him and he, he co-sponsored it with me. And in the four years that we did the program, I loved doing the program. I actually had Gina Davis, the actress, act four, come and speak, um, see it, be it, right? And uh, it went, when I left the company four years later, it went from 23% to 35.5% for four years in the, in the executive chair. And uh, they kept they keeping the program going. When I left, I left three years ago. And they're up at 40% now. Wow. So they're doing good. I got five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, five minutes for what? Just to continue talking or? Okay. Um, let me just make sure I hit all my nuggets. <laughs> That's another thing too. I don't do PowerPoint. Uh, you know, I just spoke last week and I sent my PowerPoint and I don't do PowerPoint. So I better send a PowerPoint. So I sent him a picture of a dog. <laughs> <laughs> my my um, son's gold retriever. It's gorgeous, right? And so I got and so she's like, I got there. She's like, I think you sent me the wrong deck. <laughs> I know, is that a dog on there? She says, yeah. So I told them, I said, you know, I know the sales and marketing people will say people love babies and puppies. So if you get sick of looking at me, there's the dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so anyways, you know, know what you value and take action when it's not aligned, right? And you will be happier with yourself. You'll be happier with your company. Um, the, the last one is don't run away from a crisis. Run to the crisis. I say there are people that run away and the people that run to lean in and run right in, right? Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of hard work, um, but you're gonna grow, you're gonna learn, you're gonna get noticed, right? They're gonna say, geez, you know, last time this happened, Renee, if Renee was involved and it, it came out, let's call her again, right? Uh, it shows that you are accountable and that you can deliver goods. So, you know, I know work, work is a constant crisis and some of the crises aren't your crisis, but when it is and it's in front of you, don't shy away. Be a part of it because then you get to be a part of the outcome. That's a little bit of my control freak in me. Um, so those are my nuggets and it's obviously paid off well. I, oh, I was re I'm retired from CVS for two weeks. <laughs> yeah, and the CEO of Otis Elevator, they were a subsidiary of United Technologies, and because they were combining with Raytheon, they had to spin the company, and they were just an allocation from the mothership, so I, she's like, you get to build your own IT department from scratch, and uh, of course, it wasn't all scratch, it was a lot of baggage, but uh, boy, was that fun. It really was fun. And what, what I really liked about it was I came from this big company to this smaller company. Otis is about a $14 billion company. So anything I said, they thought I was like this angel. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you've got to do it. And, and, and it seemed so easy to me because I've done what they were doing at so much scale so, so many times before. And, um, and you know, I, I actually... 
when she wanted me to come to Otis, I said, I'll give you a year. I ended up giving her a two and a half. And we're good friends. And she would take me on payroll anytime, but I'm not doing that right now. <laughs> I've got two children. I've got a granddaughter that's uh, going to be seven tomorrow and uh, a little baby on the way. I just threw a big baby shower on Sunday. So that's it. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Some uh, stay up here because we're going to do a QA. Um, some takeaways, right? Have empathy. Um, don't be hard on yourself. Affirmation. I'm going to start practicing that because I did drive here today, so I'm on my way home. And uh, the other one I really love was gratitude. So thank you so much, Renee, for taking the time to be here to speak with us. Thank you, Stacy, for bringing Renee to us. She's a gift. And also a special shout out to Delia, who's been guiding us along the way to get us here for the presentation. Okay, so we're going to have, want to share this link with folks to give feedback about the event. Um, we're also going to share the link in the chat on the Zoom. A special thank you to everyone for being here. And thank you for everyone who is on Zoom, who stuck with us through our technical difficulties. So now we're going to have the QA session. Henry's going to facilitate it. If you have a question in the room, you can raise your hand. If you have questions on Zoom, you can put them into the chat. And um, let's hear a little bit more from Renee. And I'm going to take down the slides. So anyone questions, raise your hand. Questions in the room? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Renee. I'm Carol Castle. I'm with Digital Library Technology Services. Um, thank you for your presentation. And I have to say, I mean, you, you're, you've obviously been wildly successful. And I feel like if you couldn't get CDS to shorten their receipts, then nobody would. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my question to you is, um, when, was there a moment when you realized that you were a leader or in a leadership position? And if so, can you tell us about that? The, the first time, I'll tell you when I knew I wanted to be a leader. Now, this is dating myself, so Don will, Don will know. <laughs> <laughs> um, back in the day, I was a data center, right, in a data center. And on Sundays is when they did all the maintenance. They shut down all the apps, all the vendors would come in, and maybe you're running some backups or some reorgs or things like that, database reorgs. And... Uh, there, we didn't even have a change software system. You, you would monitor the changes on an Excel spreadsheet with the vendors. And I was there, they called it babysitting. So they, it was overtime, you got to babysit and do this. And I was 26 years old when this happened. And all of a sudden, the lights went off and all the tape drives went off and the whole data center powered down. One of the vendors hit the emergency power off switch. See, Don knows the pain. <laughs> <laughs> that means everything needs to be restarted, reconnected, reinitiated. There were reorgs running, and where is everything in its cycle? And, I, and we didn't have pagers even, our cell phones back then, we had a call list. And I start calling, and I can't get a hold of anybody. So, I got on the PA and said every vendor to you know where I was, and I had my Norma Ray moment. <laughs> I actually stood on a table and just like mapped out the plan how we were going to get the data center back up. And they all had to report back to me every half hour. Right, some were doing storage, some were doing frames, you know wherever and uh, where we were in the batch cycles and we, we we figured it out and then the night shift started coming in at six o'clock at night and there I was like just still orchestrating where we were and telling the leaders at that point they knew what, what had happened where they need to focus and how, how they should prioritize getting the online day up from running. And so that felt really good. 
Um, I obviously got a lot of accolades for managing that, but I realized that that it wasn't technology that I was really going after, it was leading. And because the next day, you know, when you do the postmortem, there I was telling everybody what's happened. And oh, by the way, here is some contingency things you need to think about going forward. And I walked out of there and I went to my boss and I said, I want to be, I want to be a manager. I want to lead people. And you know, that declaration of just saying that out loud was huge for me, just declaring that I want to be a leader. And so I just took opportunities that made me want to leave and um, expand. I always, I always wanted more. And it's, uh, it wasn't necessarily about control. It's about influence. Right? I took a job for a new, the guy was the head of infrastructure. And he, and I was a manager at the night shift, or one of the shifts in the data center. And uh, I took a job with this new guy who headed the infrastructure, which was probably like $500 million worth of responsibility. And he called me, he said, listen, I was told that you knew everybody. And I said, yeah, I kind of do. Remember, I'm a Maven connector. And he said, will you work for me? He goes, I don't know anything about this company and I need somebody. And it was kind of like a chief of staff role, but I wasn't, I'm not an administrative person. That is like the furthest uh, from what I like to do. He goes, no, he goes, you're going to have access to a lot of information. You're going to, you're going to be able to help me strategize. And your job is to make sure I don't look back. Okay. I think I can do that. And he goes, and if you do this, what do you want to be like? He asked me very drunk. I was probably 30 years old at the time. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to manage the entire data centers, all of them. And it's okay, we'll work on that. Well, as it turns out, I love that job so much that I had so much influence that when the data center lead, lead, lead of all data center services came up, I didn't want it. Because then I wouldn't be in the know. And I wouldn't be able to influence. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's how I started. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question from mm -hmm. Ashley Sam Samuda on chat. And the question is, any advice for women on how to effectively manage upward, upwards in their teams? Upwards. Well, first of all, make sure people know who you are. Right. And that kind of gets into what I was saying about the crisis stuff. The other thing that I found that was very helpful for me is it, it's funny when you talk to people at Aetna, they'll say, yeah, isn't she the one that did the women's leadership stuff? They don't necessarily remember all my IT accomplishments. Right. Do things outside of your swim lane. Right. So if it's, you know, like even even this ERG for WIT, you are doing something that's going to increase your sphere mm -hmm. and people will know who you are. Um, you know, raise your hand and don't, you know, when you see the an executives, because all companies do this, they have their, you know, their EC summits or the top 200s or whatever, find a way to be a mic runner or whatever it is, to, just to get in there and get and meet a few executives. And, um, or take part in some of the, you know, fundraising events, things like that. You want the top tier to know who you are. And it was funny when um, I kind of did this, I didn't know that you're not supposed to reach out to the board of directors. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, <clears throat> I was having a conference, my first conference, you know, women, um, Women's Leadership Alliance. And one of the board of directors wrote um, a book, Barbara Franklin. It was, uh, uh, it was about affirmative action. And she, her job was to get, 
She worked for the Nixon administration. Her job was to get women into the White House. And this is when she started at the White House. She had to go in the back door. Right. Women couldn't wear pants, all that sort of stuff. And so she, uh, it's a matter, of, a matter of simple justice, that's the name of it. And uh, so I thought, geez, wouldn't it be great? She just wrote a book to invite her to this, that's be a keynote. <laughs> and I did, and she said, yes. And then I get a call from corporate, you know, hey, you know, you're really not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> and so I ended up having all the women board members on a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. And it, it, like, it was fabulous. Now, when it came time for my promotion to a senior vice president, which was very rare at Aetna, right? I think there's maybe 20 out of 90,000 people. Um, it went to the board. And guess what? Every board member knew who I was. <laughs> because of what I did outside of my technology role. Because they saw me as a leader. I think they saw me as being very authentic. And um, yeah. So. Any other questions in the room? Okay, I'll ask one. Oh, yes? Um, so um, I'm, I'm I, so the last question was about how do you manage upward? I, I'm struggling with managing downward and not in teams, but with the women underneath me, right? My, my, my daughter, you know? <laughs> yes, I'm a certain age. And yes, I have a daughter who's a junior in high school, right? And, and so, <laughs> TMI, um, what would you advise women um, in this, in the, you know, of, of this generation to sort of help bring up the, 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 the women that are coming under us? What would you advise us on that? I think uh, tomorrow is 100% right, and you have to get lower into the community. So, you know, whatever programs, one of, one of the programs that I had, uh, and they're actually doing it now at Otis, is um, the, the reach out into your communities. That's one thing you can do. You can affect local, right? And uh, so what I had done was um, brought in the young girls from like sixth grade from the Y, and we created this summer program where, you know, when, <laughs> Kids think of technology, they just think of what's on their iPad or, and it's kind of magic, right? Or they envision application developers just you know, sitting there in the dark, right? Coding. And it's so much more than that. And you have the opportunity to show them the network, show them the command center, show them, you know, there's project and program management and financials. Um, and planning. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do in technology. And but, but there, if you were to ask them in the beginning, what do you what do, what is technology to you? It's this very small, it's just you know, geeky people coding. And you know, when you think about the future of tech with AI, that piece of it is going to be less and less. It's more about imagining, coordinating, you know, influencing on making things happen across the spectrum of the entire ecosystem. So getting local in the community. So what we would do is we would bring in these, and, and which meant I had to get a commitment from my company to, we got buses to bring them, you know, because you gotta, can imagine a lot of these are from communities that are, are somewhat disparate. But what would happen is we do it all through high school and when they turned 16, they got internships, paid hey, internships. And then we would help fund their college. And next thing you know, they're working at the company summers during college and right into, and when they go right into the job, they, they actually have eight years of experience of being with the company. So they're not going in entry level, right? They're going in higher up. So we got a lot of accolades for that program. And Otis now is doing the same uh, community outreach with the girls. They started off, that's where I spoke last week. 
Thank you. One more question. Yes. Um, you just mentioned about the well, the AI and kids and future generations, uh, but you also mentioned all the skills that you mastered and practiced throughout all your mm -hmm. um, life, like leadership, communication, strategic planning, finance. Um, with the AI coming and with the future generations, what skills uh, do you think we should start even now start yeah. mastering or practicing on it? Are those the same that you were practicing or some of them and what new skills should we start yeah. Now, this is coming back. <laughs> Center of AI. So actually, I'm on um, I did this research from Anubra. I knew her, um, Abby Talk, or Abby Talk, at, uh, we had a, a reunion. And it is definitely new territory, right? But it's coming at us very fast. Well, High communication, high consultancies, like understanding the business and the business problem is huge. When you talk to a lot of technologists, they don't really understand the problem, right? They understand the technology. A lot of that is going to be generative. So they really need to understand the problem and how technology can influence or impact that problem. That's going to be very, very critical. Um, I also believe that what, what isn't out there and what should be out there is counter AI, right? What, there are no checks and balances right now, and that's why everybody is struggling. Right? The security protocol, security is huge. Um, but what is the, what I'll say the, uh, the morality of what we're doing in AI and even defense mechanisms against various actors, right? There's always going to be one out there. And right now, and, and, I, and I think the United States is trying, right, through, but, but look how slow our government is. How slow it is and look how fast it is. Understanding the checks and balances and what AI brings, and immerse yourself in um, in what I call the tech rags. So uh, we actually have this as a thing that newcomers can, can do. We had um, this week in tech because tech is, you know. Companies are buying other companies. Wait, Apple bought this, and they're not there anymore. Or Red Hat is now with IBM. You know, how do you keep track of all this technology? So get a tech magazine. It could be it could be just a tech portion in the Wall Street Journal. It could be CIO magazine. Um, Information Week's another one, right? Keep up on what's out there because then you're keeping an eye on the trends. And then how those trends can impact your scope of responsibility and your sphere of work. That's that's what I'd say right now. And keep an eye on it. The food for thought has the food for thought has been very <laughs> filling. <laughs> want to pull up um, the QR code again. Zoom. And we are close to the end of the program today. And what I will say is that we have food and that's really <laughs> exciting. We also have a job expo table. So if you want to hear more about positions that are open here at um, NYU, please visit Stan, who's our representative here today. Um, <laughs> and there's food, so <laughs> <laughs> to go ahead and get on the line, get some food. We have some table tents at the tables with questions so that you can mingle and get to know each other, as this is the networking portion of our program today. And um, so thank you all for coming. Check out the Job Expo. Ask some questions. Eat some food.
Thank you, Renee. <laughs> But I just want to the Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Okay. 